but that that's something I kind of want to stick with throughout this presentation because that's what that's what we're telling our students. Um, you know, when they graduate high school, welcome to the real world. When they graduate college, welcome to the real world. So that theme is something that I want you guys to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Um, my name is Eric Yarberry. I'm the director of education at World Services for the Blind. I have been blind my entire life, 27 years now, uh, and I have been working in the field of blindness for five years. I spent two of those years working the summer program at World Services for the Blind, helping our transition students um, either decide what they wanted to do after high school or earn college credit, whatever that looked like. And I've spent the last three years of my career as the director of education overseeing our life skills programs, our vocational programs, as well as the transition summer program. So let's kind of hop in here. Um, hold on a second, taking notes. Having tech issues, here we go. So this will be an interactive discussion. Um, you guys can chat if you want to, but I, I prefer people just hop in and, and share their thoughts and ideas. Um, so first things first, I want you to try and remember what it was like for you uh, when you were in high school. Uh, some of you that might that might be way back. Some of you it might be a, you know a few years ago. But let's talk about what what was your first job. Um, someone want to throw some ideas out there. My, my first job was actually working at the Disability Center at UALR. Um, unfortunately, I didn't, most people will probably throw out jobs like fast food restaurants, but I, I didn't have a job like that. Um, I was lucky, to, lucky enough to have a, an office job, the first job I did working minimum wage. So anybody else want to share? Yeah, Mickey D's was my first job. Yeah, I hated it too. Yeah, yeah. They, How old they were you when you did that? Uh, sixteen. Okay. Yeah, I only did it for a few months because uh, I hated it. They worked me. They made me clean toilets, and anyway, it wasn't good. That's a that's a good experience, I'm sure. Yeah, it's, it was experience <laughs> to make me know I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, that's that's good to know. Anyone else? I helped my brothers out with paper routes, um, but my first real job, like getting my own paycheck and things was uh, working in a uh, sheltered workshop for a summer. And okay. That's when, I, that's when I decided I wanted to continue with college. <laughs> yeah. Let me have one more share. I'll share mine. Okay. Um, I had a pretty unusual one and I worked at um, the zoo in the, in the kitchen, making all the oh, food. Oh, that's, that is an unusual one. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so one, one thing, no matter what, it, what your job was, it, Everybody can remember their first job, whether we share it or not. We all know what that first job was. Um, for the most part, everybody wants to get a job to be independent. And that first job, whether it made you feel independent, what, what, like Brent said, however you felt walking away from that job, that stuck with you and that, that feeling motivated you, whether that was positive or negative. Um, so that brings us to transition. Uh, what is transition and, and where do we all fit in? Uh, transition for the sake of today's presentation is going to be looking at high schoolers graduating and moving on to college, but transition can happen at any point in our lives, as we all know. Um, and this isn't just for blind and visually impaired students. So I'm kind of covering more generally, uh, but I'll, I'll jump into blind and visually impaired as, as I, I have to, but for the most part, I think the general discussion applies to, to us, to our students. Um, so, let me see. So, 
So one thing that I kind of want to point out is when you're transitioning from high school into the workforce, um, you always feel like you want to get out on your own. Um, like I said, our, our theme really is welcome to the real world. And that's kind of what we tell our students. It's what we're told. Uh, and, and I think that because we tell our students that us as professionals, we always say, hey, you can you can reach out to us whenever you want to. Um, you can lean on us if you need us. But we turn around and, and we always tell them, you know, it's going to be tough out there. You're going to need to learn how to do this on your own. Uh, but we need to change the way we're, we're phrasing those things. I think our students are that they're assuming that because we're adults, we wouldn't ask for help. So why should why should they? So first, I, th I think we really need to change change our language. And I am going to talk about our programs along the way, but I, I kind of want to talk about this overall. But us as educators, rehabilitators, um, all across the board just need to be more willing to actually more willing to pull students to us and create an open atmosphere where students are actually willing to, to talk to us. Um, if you look at the high school environment, for example, students are always pushed to move on to the next test, to get homework completed, to be on time, um, not be late. Uh, and there's always someone there or, or multiple people there holding their hand and actually pushing them. But that's not the real world. And we, we know that, um, but the students don't often know that. Uh, the students that we work with, especially the ones that I see come through our summer programs. Um, I, I spend a lot of my time over the summers doing wake up duty um, and dorm patrol, just getting students out of the bed at 8 a.m. They miss breakfast. Uh, and that's, those are things that we don't think of. If you work in the profession, you do, but, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't think, man, Someone needs to teach these kids how to set an alarm. You know, in, in a grumpy tone, you could say that and it'd be, it'd be fine. But for the, for the most part, our students coming out of high school and into college, uh, they need to understand that they can lean on us uh, and, and we need to create an open atmosphere, like I said. And some things that I think we can do to really help foster that is, first of all, help our students know that they're not alone. So if in our summer programs, we, we have group meetings where our students are able to share problems that they encounter and they know that their peers are actually going through the same thing. Um, and you, in your own, working with your own students, bring two or more together and let them talk to, to one another. Um, it's, it's really important for our students to have that, that peer feedback. Uh, as much as we think we know every time we see a situation that's gone wrong, we say, well, I told them that should, you know, but if you get them in touch with their peers and you, you open them up um, to the community uh, of folks that are going through the same thing they're going to going through, uh, you'll, I think there'll be a lot better outcome. Um, that being said, definitely help our students find interest groups um, establish a constant connection with our students, as well as, you know, really lean into that support system and make them feel that when they really do need you, uh, they can call you. And that comes down to getting to know each and every one of our students. That sounds like a burden. And I know some of you carry caseloads, uh, 70, 80, maybe even more. Um, and I, I think that, you know, being able to bring them together in group settings can help you pinpoint where the problems are. Um, and that, that goes into understanding their story because there's, there's no way, I totally understand that there's no way you can sit down and understand every single person's story, there's just not enough time. But I think getting the, the basics down, understanding uh, what socioeconomic uh, situation someone grew up in, uh, one person compared to another person, maybe someone, in my situation, I had a single parent and I had one sibling growing up. Um, my situation compared to someone who had four siblings and a single parent, that's totally different. So there's, everyone's facing multiple variables and something to keep in mind. Um, another thing is really just off, offer to listen, not to provide advice. And that's something that we try to do here 
I've got students, even adults that we work with here, come to me with with situations where they they're seeking advice, and it's not my job to solve our students' problems. And and I understand that's that's across the board. Um, but those developing those problem solving skills, we we do that in our summer program with our transition kids. Uh, if they have an issue in the class, I'm not going to write an email to their instructor for them. I'll sit down with them and show them how to write that email and actually what to say and how to say that. And I, I and and I'm not saying overall like our system. I'm definitely not doing everything right. You guys definitely are doing doing everything right. But I'm just kind of sharing. So that being said. I think it's important to get down to the individual. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm looking at here. So figure out what your students actually want to do when they grow up. Uh, some of you may have just gotten into the, the jobs that you're in now. Um, those of you who were working jobs like McDonald's or at the zoo, um, obviously you're not doing that now, but what happened between then and now and that's something that we, we need to share with our students to say, hey, that, that first job you have, that's, that's not going to, you're not going to be stuck there forever. Um, this is a stepping stone. And I've got some interesting statistics that I'm going to be sharing along the way. Uh, but really sitting down with students and, and painting that picture and showing them that, hey, what the first job you have, just because it's not something that you're interested in doing now, is something that will put a little bit of money in your pocket. And, and as my father-in-law says, builds character. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a funny tidbit. So I, I want to jump into the stats I was talking about. Um, 2017, the median weekly at, uh, pay was $718. So median weekly earnings of high school graduates was $718. Sorry, got to be more specific there. Our students who are on disability checks, because I'm, I'm going to go there. Um, I, I, like I said, I'm blind. I've been on a disability check myself. So I, I know that we're looking at, you know, anywhere from $650 to $800 a month. Just with a high school diploma, if they were to go find an entry level full time position, I know that's difficult, especially right now during COVID, but we're looking long term here. The median earnings per week was $718. Even if they worked part time, they would be able to surpass the that $700 that they might earn on disability. And a lot of our students, they see, and I understand this is an issue too. They see our our older blind individuals living on a disability check, and they think that's okay. But I think if you sit down with students, and we do during our summer program, and say, hey. If you're on your parents' insurance, you'll be on their insurance until you're 26. Your job is to, re is to earn enough money uh, between now and then. That's a long time to where you can actually get on your own insurance. Uh, and hopefully that's not um, disability, any of the insurance that's supported by Social Security. So World Services for the Blind summer program consists of two tracks. Um, a lot of people know about our college prep program. It's kind of been on and off over the past few years, but we've always had students in it ever since I've been here. Um, last year, it was all virtual and all five, because it was the first year we had it, all five of our virtual students earn college credit. Um, I'm very proud of those students, and they, they worked really hard to make that happen. Uh, we also have a career track where students come through. And right now we have programs in multiple career clusters. So they're able to kind of get a look into each one of our vocational programs, uh, if that might interest them as well. So some more statistics for you. Uh, only 33.4% of individuals older than the age of 25 uh, have a bachelor's degree. And that's that's for our students, most likely a lot, a lot lower, obviously, but these are general statistics. Uh, only 36% of 
36% of job openings as of 2019 require a high school diploma. If you stack that to an associate's degree, if you, you graduate high school and you get an associate's degree, the job market has opened, you, you've been open to 63% of the job market just with a two-year degree. Uh, again, I know a lot of students who are sitting at home are blind individuals, not necessarily students anymore, who are sitting at home drawing a disability check with a four-year degree plus. Um, so some things we can do to, to counteract that is recognize that four-year degrees are highly overvalued. Uh, I, instead, let's look at an associate's degree just to get our students who need the extra support. Uh, I, again, I'm talking about blind and visually impaired students, get them that two-year degree uh, so that they have a resting place. And like I said, that opens them up to 63% of the job market. That's a big deal, especially of our, uh, with our students who uh, face unemployment odds anyway. Um, that's to me, sitting back and I know multiple individuals who are blind, who it took them four years was, was abnormal. I mean, we're looking at six, seven years to finish a, a bachelor's degree, I'm sorry. So not only that, but trade schools might be an option. Um, let's find internships for our kids. Um, and if, it's, if they're paid internships, make that payment minimum wage. Uh, if, if a kid is filing papers, that's not $20 an hour. And, and we, we all know that. And I think if, if you actually pay someone minimum wage, they understand more, more so what minimum wage means. Whereas if, if you internships are paying $20 an hour and it's not $20 an hour work, they're never going to actually go out and seek a job. There's no incentive at that point. So I wanna to transition to, to college. Uh, I, and I'm trying not to beat everyone over the head with statistics, but how many of you utilized a tutor while you were going through school? Uh, and, and just kind of, you can chat that, you can discuss that. Uh, and then I've got a follow-up question. Uh, what clubs or organizations did you belong to while you were in college? So, and I can start. I actually didn't utilize a tutor in college until I was a junior. Um, and clubs and organizations, I was in Phi Beta Lambda, which was Future Business Leaders of America. And I was in a, a collegiate sport club. So, anybody else want to share? So again, the question is, did anyone utilize tutoring services in school? Uh, and what clubs and organizations did you belong to? I used a tutor in uh, classes like chemistry and uh, some advanced math classes that were pretty visual. And uh, okay. I was involved very little in uh, sports or clubs. Okay. Let me have one more response. We do have someone who wrote in the chat, and I will read okay. it yeah. right now. Um, from Dina, um, I'm not visually impaired, but I work for a regional library of the National Library Service. Um, I see a big need for assistive technology trainers. The technology is out there, but people have to learn how to use it. Yeah, good point. So does anyone else want to share if they utilize tutoring services or what clubs or organizations they belong to? I'm going oh, never. Okay. Go ahead. Um, no, I, I didn't use any of the tutoring services, I guess, I'm, but at the same time using study groups, you know, with other peers and stuff, I, kind of the same deal. So we did that on occasion. Um, belong to, I had a Greek chapter and um, actually a, another Greek class chapter, psychology 
club chapter, various different clubs and organizations. Brent, were you going to share as well? Uh, no, I was just going to say, I, I never really, I, I went to school a little bit later. Of course, I, I went to college at first, but it was a junior college, didn't really have any of that, uh, any of that, you know, like your, uh, your chapters or anything like that. But um, the only thing I really did, I, I, I did a, I did some, some uh, uh, tutoring myself, but I didn't didn't actually take any. I did I did help some people. Yeah, but yeah, I understand that. For me, okay. So, what this kind of points to, and I, I what I'm getting to is there really is room. There's a lot of room for us to jump in and help our kids. Like Brent said, at the smaller schools, there's not a lot of. Um, there's really not a lot of services. The, the community college uh, student to teacher ratios are awesome, especially at uh, UAPTC here in Little Rock. It's a small community college for those of you not from Arkansas. Uh, but that, that school, like I said, the associate's degree path is great for our students. Um, but that school has great disability services. But then when you transfer into a four-year degree school, um, we can really start looking at helping our students find clubs and organizations to join. Um, that's something we do with our summer, our students going through the summer program. Uh, because truthfully, you're going, and, and you know, it's cliche to say this, but networking is what's gonna get you jobs down the road. And I know everyone on this call knows that, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Uh, and I think that clubs and organizations, whether you develop your own study groups, that's something that I did, as well as join organizations. Um, those people are the people that I talk to still today, more so than the people I talked with in high school. Um, even though I went to the School for the Blind, a very small school, and still know a lot of those people, uh, they're just their interests and hobbies don't align with with mine, and that's fine. That's that's something we need to make sure that our students know is first of all. You, you're, you're visually impaired, we understand that, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your friends are always going to be visually impaired. There's a lot more interest uh, for you out there. There's a lot more hobbies for you to get involved in. And being visually impaired is, is we understand that, that brings a lot of our students together, but at the end of the day, that turns out to be all they talk about. Um, so I wanna narrow down and I'm gonna transition into career and technical education in a moment, but I wanna narrow down to the, the college setting. So according to the US Department of Education, 19% uh, of 18 to 24 year old, four year olds on college campuses uh, are, have a self-proclaimed disability. Uh, so we're looking at 20 out of 100 students on a college campus say they have a disability of some sort. Uh, at the so based on information from the Association for Higher Education and Disability, this is the group of people that work, that, that lead disability center, that conferences for disability center directors. Uh, they say that about 10% on average of students with disabilities on college campuses. So out of that 20 out of 100, two of those actually come to the, the disability center and that's mind boggling. And I, I checked that through multiple people, uh, UCA, UALR, U of A, they're all saying the same thing. And it, it blows my mind um, that the numbers are that low that are actually saying they need services. And to get even lower, 5% um, or, or have, sorry, I'm sorry, 50% of those actually utilize the services. Um, so that's, the numbers of people who are actually getting the services that are available to them who have a disability on a college campus, extremely low. Um, so it's important for us to get our students in the door of the disability center. Um, if the disability center freaks out when our students walk through and say, oh no, blind, uh, we sit down and we talk to them or we look at another school and that's not a problem. Um, and we're there 
especially during our summer programs, we'd meet with Reed Claiborne, the director of the University of Arkansas at Little Rock Disability Resource Center. Uh, he talks to our students as well as uh, all of them go through the, the registration process. Um, at, at the university here, students send letters, they're customized letters, and they're sent out from the Disability Center, and, and they encourage the professor to meet with the student, if at all possible, but they more, more so they re basically reinforce the fact that, hey, I need accommodations. I'm going to need to sit in the front row. I need uh, handouts in digital format, and I'm going to need to use the testing center. A lot of our students are terrified to stand out. We know what that looks like in the high school setting. Um, that doesn't change much in college. So when students are on their own, it's they're, they're even more likely to feel obligated to blend in with cloud, the, the crowd. Uh, so we get our students in front of the Disability Center, um, show them how to navigate that process. And for me personally, when I first got to college, um, I actually went to the, the college campus three months before I started. So roughly, you know, May, the month I was graduating and was meeting with the Disability Center, getting all the paperwork that I needed. Most disability centers are fairly lenient on paperwork. Um, if they can tell that someone's blind, they're gonna say, hey, I need a doctor's note uh, and let's get the ball rolling. So make sure that, that you're there with them and we're definitely there with them um, to walk them through that process to see what that actually looks like. Um, another stat for you, 30% of college freshmen drop out. Uh, that's, that's big. Um, I don't know what that looks like for our, our students, uh, but I, I do know that if we're there helping them navigate the system, we can keep our kids engaged, we can keep our kids in school, um, and more so we can point them on the right direction to a, to a career uh, and off of a disability check. So within our summer program, we also, like I said, we, we help them figure out clubs and organizations, but we also talk about personal finance and what it looks like to live within your means. Um, that sounds so boring to so many of our kids, but if you put the cost of an apartment and utilities alone and you stop there in front of our kids, that's most likely over a disability check. Um, and that's, it's fun to, to show students what you can spend with a minimum wage job versus what it looks like living on a disability check. And that's, I, I, I keep going back to that, but that's our, that's our audience and that's the students we're working with right now. Um, so does anyone have questions about the, the college track? We do uh, put all of our students, if they have no college credit, we automatically put them in a communications course. Uh, we have a great relationship with the, the communications department as well as the English department. So our students can go through comp one or comp two or communications. Uh, this year, we had a student go through algebra and she did fairly well. Like I said, everyone passed. She did awesome actually thinking about it. But really, if someone needs algebra, we have a TVI who works with the students over the summer that knows braille that knows accessibility so they're able to to help with that um and and those students are they're never just yeah they're thrown to the wolves as far as putting them in a college class it's unfamiliar um but they always have the support uh and the tools that they gain and, and the techniques that they gain from just five weeks of college class navigating that and if any of you have taken a summer class, you know how rapid it is, how fast it is. And then when they get into the fall semester, they're like, this is a lot slower and wasn't as nearly as intense um, as the summer program. To that effect, we also, if we see that someone's not prepared for college, even if they do pass, uh, we definitely recommend uh, training in specific areas, whatever the weak areas, whatever those areas may be. Uh, and that information goes back to the counselor. So. It's, it's a team effort, and I'm, I'm always going to say that. I'm not paid to say that. Um, it, it really is a team effort. We make sure that 
the students we serve together uh, are getting the tools they need to be independent. And that looks so different to everybody. So are there any questions about the college track so far? Um, we do have a comment from Dina in the chat, and I'm just going to read it because it's a really good point. Um, in Texas, at least, grade school students have accommodations set up. They don't have to ask, so it can be a big change when young people go to college and suddenly nothing is set up for them. They have to make absolutely, absolutely advocate for themselves and request accommodations. It can be difficult. Yeah, it's when you're exactly right. And I was talking to a teacher this week about that is when your students have uh they just show up to the act and everything's in braille um or you know and they've got the extended time and they've got multiple snack breaks um that doesn't happen and so you're exactly right and that's something that we help students navigate but that is a big deal uh and, and that's something that the, Dis the disability resource center talks to our students about to make sure that they know, hey, these accommodations aren't going to magically appear. No one is out there just to keep blind people from earning a college degree. It's just, I, I think I realized that every college professor was different um, early, probably my second year of college. And then I realized like, wow, some of these people, this is their part-time job. Um, they've never met a blind person before. So Teaching our students to be, um, I mean, our students can be savages. I'm just going to say that. They, they've, they've been entitled to these accommodations, and they go in there and tell uh, a college professor, like, I am I, I am entitled to this, and that's not the, the way we have that discussion. That's something that we make sure um, that we teach, because I, that's, that's happened, uh, and that's embarrassing. So anybody have any other questions about that or comments? Because that was a good comment. Okay, so as far as our uh, career track for the summer, um, we have a, a, a wide variety of programs here at World Services. I, I have to plug us obviously, because it's our webinar, but when students come in our program for the summer and they're not wanting to do a college track, uh, we get them involved in all of our classes uh, at the vocational training level. So they're able to see Okay, am I interested in credit counseling, medical billing, uh, IT, assistive technology instruction, massage therapy, whatever it may be. And if you've got, so out of the 16 career clusters, we cover about seven of them, just with our programs alone here on campus. But that being said, WSB is not the end all be all. Uh, we're here to help serve your students, um, but we do expose students to our programs uh, through our to our vocational program, so they have an idea. Is are these areas at least the career cluster area? Is that a specific area that you want to go into? For example, finance. Um, so they kind of they get a feel for that. So uh, a statistic, another statistic, is after ten years, a, a worker with a one year certificate was earning on average only. $1,300 less than an individual with a bachelor's degree. And these numbers come from, if you think about it, you're looking at plumbers, welders, mechanics, uh, IT professionals, especially massage therapists. Again, these, these, trade, these trades that as we know now, especially in Arkansas, uh, this week for plumbers is uh, they are making a lot of money. Uh, we're not prepared for a snowstorm, obviously. So that's kind of, I think, where that comes from. So another fact for trade schools is someone who graduates with a technical or trade uh, diploma, on average, their median salary looks like about 35000 uh, And what that means for our students who are living on disability is if you look at that, what we call the cash cliff, what it would cost for them after insurance, after uh, all the benefits they get for living on disability, the, it starts to benefit them 
to get off of the couch and get off of the disability check right at about $30,000. Not many people talk about that. Not many people break that down. But after you run the cost of what they're earning, plus insurance, plus any other benefits they receive, it's about $30,000. So um, if you guys are interested in our program, our summer program, you can read more about it at wsblind.org, obviously. And then you can go to programs and services and the youth program is right there on that page and you can click on that. We do have, you can apply on that page as well. Um, at this point though, I wanna open it up for any questions, just overall or anything that anyone wants to throw out there. Uh, and really thank you guys for joining. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, so, yeah, I just want to want to end there. Um, thank you all. I also just want to say that I'm going to leave the link to our transitional youth page program in the chat. Okay. Appreciate it, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I had a um, Eric. You just you just brought out that statistic um, about the thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. How did y'all? I'm curious to to hear that or kind of what went into figuring. If um, you, I can I can send you what I found on that, but that's something we use pretty often because mm -hmm. it's look. If you, I mean, if you figure out say 700 bucks a month plus your insurance costs. Um, most of our students, they, they come in here and they say, well, I want to earn a job. And I'm not kidding. I've got this down to the dollar sign. I want to earn $12 and it's like 41 cents an hour. Um, or I have to be making like $16 an hour or something like that. Uh, it's, it's pretty ridiculous, but that's about where we're walking after you run the the if you estimate insurance and all the other benefits that come along with that but i can i'll send i'll and we'll share that too i'll make sure that i share that because that's one of the favorite things i like to share yeah that sounds interesting if um because i mean we'll do well like like you and steph doing the real life arkansas and um things of that nature is just kind of get a, a real look at what things cost and what they're going to have to turn around and and do and the benefits of employment versus you know the the social security benefits yeah so anytime we can kind of juxtapose those two numbers uh, and give them information i'm all for that so yeah me too obviously yeah I, i'm a big fan of that but yeah yeah that'd be cool i'd appreciate it all right i'll do that i'll talk to you later okay thank you Hi, Eric, it's Whitney. Great job. Um, could you share that information with me when you get it put together? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we can also include it. Um, I'm going to send an email out with the recording of this webinar. Um, and we can include all that information in that email as well. So everyone okay. can have it. It sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we can okay. into the webinar here. That's fine. Thank you, guys.